Good afternoon. <clears throat> On behalf of the Historical Society of Harford County, welcome to this afternoon's Brown Bag Lunch, Junius Brutus Booth and Tudor Hall. I'm Jackie Seneshaw, your host for this Brown Bag Lunch. Our guest today is Mr. Tom Fink, president of the Junius B. Booth Society and director of Tudor Hall Museum. We are excited this today to be trying out an in-person broadcast for the first time. We express our thanks to our intrepid cameraman, George Harrison, for all of his help and expertise. Sadly, the Booth family name is most associated with Junius's son, John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. That deed has almost totally obscured the tremendous contribution that Junius Booth and his sons made to the American theater. Today, Tom is going to introduce us to our neighbor who made his American family home here in Harford County. So Tom, tell us, tell us who was Junius Booth? Junius Brutus Booth, to most people, they did not know him. Um, a lot of people know him as the father of John Wilkes Booth and Edwin Booth. But what most people don't know is that he became one of the greatest actors in America during the first half of the 19th century. So tell me about his background and his younger years. I believe he was born in England. Yes, he was born in London, England in 1796. His father, Richard Booth, was a, an attorney. His mother, Jane Game Booth, um, died when he was just four years old in childbirth, giving birth to his younger sister, Jane. Um, Richard had quite a handful with Junius as growing up. Uh, when he barely got to the age of 13, he was charged with a paternity suit. Um, yeah, from, looks like he was having a little too much fun with uh, the neighbor's household help. His father defended him in, in um, court and his father ended up paying 40 pounds, which was a lot of money back then. Um, Junius did well in school. He was able to conversationally speak many um, languages. He spoke Greek, Latin, Hebrew, uh, Italian, French, and Dutch. He could speak that conversationally um, throughout his life. And his father, trying to keep him out of trouble, um, ended up getting a um, internships for him. And he interned for a printer, um, a law office, um, an architect, and sculptor. And out of all these, he liked the sculpting best. But um, he, when he was 17 years old, he signed on to be a midshipman. And right before he shipped out, he was charged with a second paternity suit. And his father had to defend him again. He couldn't sail off. So went to court and father had to pay monetarily again. So he put Rich uh, Junius to work in his law offices. And it was this time when Junius saw his first play at, at Covent Garden Theater and he saw Othello and he, by Shakespeare and he just fell in love with it. He had never seen anything like it and he was really taken with it. He got such an interest in it. He went out and started buying all the strip scripts he could get a hold of. Um, he went to every performance, every play he could go to, and his favorite play was Richard III. And what he did was he studied Richard III line by line and tried to memorize the whole play, all the parts. He envisioned all the, the gestures and movements he would make, and that got him started. So from there... He ended up going to a small theater and his first performance at a small theater was in John Bull. And he, he got the bug. Two years later, he's on a ship bound for Europe and he traveled the continent with a, an acting troupe and performed all over. And when he was staying in Brussels, he was at the home of a Madame Delanoy. And her youngest daughter, his, uh, his youngest daughter, Adelaide, he uh, made quick friends with, uh, turned more into a, a romance, and then she, he ended up getting her pregnant. So at the end of the tour, 
they eloped and went to England at that point. And that was against her mother's wishes. And he, they stayed with his father, Richard, and he had to go make a living. So he started acting in theaters. So he started at small theaters, went into larger theaters. Finally, he went up to, to uh, some of the largest theaters and was acting with the top actors of the day in, in Covent Garden theaters and also Drury Lane. And the top actor at that time in England was Edmund Keane. And Edmund Keane didn't want any new rivals and this new upstart was threatening him. And back in those days, theater was a little different than theater is here in America. It was more like a sporting event, it really was. Um, most people knew all the plays. They didn't go there to see the story. They went there to see their favorite actors and cheer them on. And Edmund Keane had a whole group of people um, that called themselves the Wolves. And Junius ended up getting a group of people called the Boothites and made the papers. And when they played on the same stage, um, the wolves would scream and shout and start banging their walking sticks, um, throwing oranges, orange peels, trying to disrupt Junius. And the Boothites would do the same when Ed McKean was up there and it could get violent. Sometimes um, fights broke out inside the theater and outside the theater. And this made the papers and there were cartoons made up of the rivalry at the time. And it just got very intense for a young actor, Junius. Um, one day, Junius was coming out of the theater and he bumped into this young woman, young girl actually, he's only 18 years old, he was only 25. And her name was Mary Ann Holmes. And she was a flower girl and her, and her father uh, was a seedsman and owned a nursery and she she worked for him and they struck up a friendship and he just fed fell head over heels in love with her and he kept seeing her he wrote her letters eventually he snuck off to france with her for two three weeks under the guise of um going on a theater tour and they came back home and he was just smitten with her. And he always said that Adelaide was, loved him for his position he was had in the theater and the, and the notoriety that would bring them. But he said Marianne loved him for who he was and he really felt a kinship with her. So he wanted to go off and have a longer vacation. So they decided to go to the West Indies. So they, before they boarded the ship, he bought a piebald pony named named a peacock. And the three of them went um, on board the ship and landed in Madeira, an island off of Portugal. And they spent three weeks there, had a lot of fun and a lot of wine, a lot of food. And it was there that she told Junius that she was pregnant. Now, he could not go back to England with Marianne at this point because that would ruin his career. That, it would get in the papers, the mess with Adelaide. So he didn't know what to do, but there was a ship in a harbor down in, in where they were staying. He went down and asked the ship where it was going, it was going to America. So he bought tickets to all three of them to go to America and they made passage to America and landed in Norfolk, Virginia. That's how they got to America. So where did he go when he came to America? Where was the first place he stopped? Well, he needed to make a living and he needed to send money back to Adelaide. Adelaide had no idea about his relationship and she wouldn't know for 21 years. Really, he couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> he kept it hidden for 21 years. But he went to Richmond, started acting there. His reputation as an actor preceded him. so. He easily got work and people were blown away by his acting. He was so intense. He was just fiery and no one had seen um, Shakespeare portrayed like that. Uh, so eventually he started going up and down the coast, kept Adelaide in Richmond because she was pregnant. And that's where she- Marianne I was in Richmond. Adelaide's still- Oh, Adelaide, in that's right. No, <laughs> well, Adelaide's right. in London. Yeah, she doesn't London. know anything. Marianne in Richmond. And they had their first child and named <clears> Junius <throat> Brutus Booth. Junior. And then he wanted to, he decided he wanted to be in a location that was kind of in the middle of 
where he would tour points north and south. So he he uh, decided on Baltimore. They got a row house here, you know, um, around Baltimore. And in the summers, it was really hot on the eastern seaboard, humid, and that theater shut down. So he didn't want to be in Baltimore at that time. He wanted to get outside of the city where it was cooler and away from any people he knew from England bump into him and find out he has another family. So he rented a house here in Bel Air um, on a farm. It was a little log house and he loved it. And the following year, he loved it so much that he, he obtained 160 acres next to it in 1824. And in 1825, he obtained an additional 17 acres. And that's where he was, wanted to make his farm. So he bought the house and the log house and moved it across several acres. And before he did this, his father, Richard, came out and visited him and went to stay with him and lived here in America for the rest of his life. Um, not yet. So I'm, I'm going to get read a couple of descriptions of moving the log house and the, the, actually the property and how it looked. Um, this is Asia Booth, um, one Junius's younger daughter, and she describes moving the log house across the field. So here it goes. Moving the log house across the fields on the rollers drew a crowd of fascinated onlookers. Asia Booth Clark, daughter of Junius and Marianne Booth, said this, this proceeding caused great wonderment among the villagers as every available man, ox, and horse that could be hired were in requisition. Much time and money were expended in this undertaking, but a successful accomplishment stamped the owner as a mastermind and the more fiercely the winter storms raged and the summer tornadoes swept by, the more wise did he appear to those who had predicted the quick demolition of the taut little cabin. And there's a description by Stanley Kimmel in the Mad Booths of, of Maryland who describes what he did with this new farm of his. A cherry shoot was planted near the door and grew to be a favorite shade tree for the family, gatherings on warm afternoons. Brown was cleared, a vineyard planted, and an orchard laid out. Stables were erected, horses and cows purchased, dairy built, and a nearby spring in which an enormous green bullfrog bullfrog croaked was ornamented with a granite ledge and steps. He also built this pond there, dammed up the stream. And that pond is still there today. He built it um, so his kids could use it as a, a swimming hole. And I'll just do one more uh, uh, quote here from Asia, because she describes the property, how it was back then, not as it is now, which is all developed. Back then, she describes it at this, this, this diminutive log cabin stands in a clearing encompassed by huge oaks, sycamores, and poplars. The forest scenery is romantic and beautiful. There are huge rocks with tiny cascades, streams and springs of delightful water gushing out in the most remote places, natural bowers of flowering vines and groves of tall interlacing trees, wild flowers of every shape and hue, from the simple field violet to the spotted lily and scarlet lobelia of the marsh, long copses of hazel bushes and old English hips and halls, and nuts of various kinds abound. The way off in the great forest where the light seldom penetrates is the dismal swamp covered with gorgeous lilies and bright grasses. And here on the smooth sward are those magical fairy rings on which no grass ever grows. Here too is the old well-trodden footpath of the Algonquin Indian and wandering far away through the dark still woods, the ground is strewn with the memorials of these lovers of warfare and the chase. Arrowheads of every dimension, ax heads and tomahawks and curiously cut stones are thickly buried in the marsh ground, as if for all time these solemn woods should keep their memory. Here in these wild forests, my father made his home, far removed from the turmoil of city life, and surrounded by his growing family and faithful servants, among whom he labored with the zeal of an anxious farmer. I love that description of it. It was very remote, and eight of his 10 children were born here on the farm. So eight of his 10 children are born on the farm. That would include Edwin and John Wilkes, whom we know, as yes. well as Asia. Now, Rosalie was an older daughter. Rosalie was born in 1823 when they were, were renting the log house. So she wasn't born on the property. It was 
Um, uh, four of his children died, three of them from cholera. Um, and one, when he went back, he did make a trip back to England in 1825 with his kids and sat with a, uh, for a portrait with Adelaide and his son Richard and hid his family at, at, at Marianne's house. And she never found out. But he, he made a second trip back and but she, uh, Adelaide happened to be living in, in Brussels at that time. And his son, Henry Byron, which was his favorite son, died there of smallpox and was buried there. So, so Henry is actually bar buried in England. Yes. Okay, so we've talked about a little bit about Rosalie. We've talked about Asia. We've talked about Henry. Let's talk about Edwin. Because as I recall, Edwin spent probably the most time with his father. Yes. Um, Mary Ann decided Junius needed a helper and someone who could watch after him. A helper or a supervisor? <laughs> well, it ended up being a supervisor. Um, Junius wouldn't want to be called like his son was supervising him, but she needed someone to watch him, keep him from going into bars, make it to theaters on time, make sure the money got back. So he ended up um, traveling with him and, and it was quite an experience for him. He's only 14 years old when he started this. Um, he saw the seediest side of life and the rough side of life. Um, and his father was no easy person to handle because he um, had what they, his, Richard called his freaks. And he had all kinds of episodes and it was usually associated with drinking alcohol. You got to remember in those days, acting was very difficult profession to be in. Um, the travel was tough. The, the, the taverns and the places you could stay were rough. Sometimes you had to walk to, to, um, from town to town. Um, in the winter, it was rough. Um, and they'd be performing six days a week. And sometimes juniors would be performing three separate plays in one day. And the intensity of it, when he acted, he got into those parts and it just frazzled him after a while. And he drank to try to relieve that, but that he just went crazy with that. So there are lots of stories about what happened on the road. Can you share with us a couple of us? There's one that I recall involves a keyhole. No. <laughs> try to keep, trying to keep Junius Brutus Booth from drinking was a full-time job. Um, sometimes theater, theater owners would have him even locked in jail the night before a performance to keep and make sure he'd be there and sober. And other times he, they lock him in his hotel room. And so one day he was locked in a hotel room and he happened to um, get the attention of a passing bellhop and convinced him to put a straw through the keyhole and into some strong drink. And there he imbibed. So he was drinking the whiskey and the whiskey's on the outside of the door. Yes. And he has a straw and through the keyhole and he's drinking it. Yes. I give the man points for creativity. Yeah. <laughs> he was a very creative man. There are other times. Um, oh, let me, uh, there was a, there was a time when um, he was on a boat heading to South Carolina with his good friend who was a comedic actor named Thomas Flynn. And he wanted to ask Tom said, I want to, I want to um, know when, get to the point where this actor named William Conway had committed suicide and jumped off a boat. He was a failed actor. He was despondent and he jumped off a boat. And Tom didn't want to tell him because he didn't know what Junius was going to do. He was drinking. So what happened was he um, snuck away during dinner and actually jumped off the boat just jumped off the steamboat and a couple of the crew members happened to see it. So they turned the boat around and went back to him and they lowered a lifeboat in and Tom Flynn got in the lifeboat. They went out and Tom put his hand out trying to pull Junius up and Junius said, Tom, you're a heavy man. Um, be careful. You don't want to tip the boat. We'll all die. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Um, yeah, he, he would um, sometimes get so intense on stage that in a sword fight, he would, he would actually try, 
the actors got scared of because they knew if he when he was trying to run them through if they didn't get out of the way they would be dead at one point when he was supposed to die in a sword fight he wouldn't die he just kept fighting and fighting it got more intense and the actor got scared and finally he got so scared he ran off the stage junius chased him chased him down the aisle and he ran out of the theater well, that would certainly change the whole storyline. Yes. <clears throat> now, he didn't always stay for the play, as I recall. No. Sometimes when he didn't feel it and he was he was feeling so intense and he just couldn't get into the play. One time he walked out onto the stage playing Richard III. He, he made his appearance. He walked across the stage with the sword slapping against his leg, walked off the other side of the stage, left the building, and they couldn't find him for days. <laughs> he was down by a river with a bunch of, I guess, hobo type people and uh, drinking. And they finally found him. And and as soon as the uh, they got him, the hobos said, "You're the great actor." We didn't even know that. And he got up, "Yes, I am." And he just got up and as the actor again and walked back and got in the theater. And you you wonder why theater owners would hire him with this reputation and he had that reputation i mean if you have to lock somebody up in a jail to make sure they get there the next day it's not that responsible but the reason being is if the audience forgave him his public forgave him and and the theater owners did too because when he was on he was there was nothing like him he was just a fantastic actor and nobody saw shakespeare um, ever portrayed that way so i know our talk is about Junius, but Edwin traveled with him. Did Edwin ever get on the stage when he was traveling with his father? Um, his father never wanted Edwin to be an actor. Um, he let him play banjo sometimes before the before a play started, and Edwin backstage heard and listened to. He he didn't have an education. He, he was only educated up to a point of. 14, he was on the road with his father constantly. No, we in Bel Air would take exception to that. He did attend the Bel Air Academy. He got some education. <laughs> Up to the age of 14. 14 that's right. Yes. Um, so he listened to all the, the plays and he en ended up memorizing all the lines and he listened to how every actor interpreted it. So he knew these plays. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, one time his father said he was he was going to perform Richard III and they went to a hotel room and Edwin is trying to get him okay dad it's time to go we got to get to the theater and he goes I'm sick I can't play I can't do it he said well you got to get to the theater then it's going to start and he goes you do it you go ahead and play do my part here's Richard the third Richard the third here's my costume and uh Edwin was just astonished and went to the theater manager, the stage manager, and said, my father says, I'm going to play. And he goes, OK, go ahead. We need to, to, to go on. And he went out and played it um, in this big costume. It's much wider than he was. And he did it. But the audience accepted him. He, they didn't know he was the, the, the son of Junius. And he actually got applause, and a, a great applause at the end. And he went back to his father room in a hotel and his father said how did it go and edwin tells this told the story and he said i always suspect my father was in the back of the theater watching me and he had set this whole thing up with his with the, the theater manager and so he knew he could act and he knew his son had what it took to act so yes he did act with his father um do you have any stories of his behavior here in bel air well, Junius, actually here in Bel Air, Junius on the farm was most happy when he was on the farm. He, uh, he really wanted to farm. He didn't do it for a living, but he took it seriously. And that's where he um, stayed. He got in shape all summer, uh, kept in shape to go on his long tours. Um, he, would, he would grow his crops and he sold chickens and dairy products and eggs and he would pack them all up into a wagon and get hook up Peacock, the piebald who's been with him all these years, Pony, and they go down into Baltimore and sell his goods. And he loved it. Um, yeah, he, he loved farming. 
And, well, another thing, he was the first in the area ever to use bone meal. Um, no one had heard about it, but he got these journals from England on gardening and he advertised for animal skeletons and he would burn them, grind them up and use it for fertilizer. And everyone around him didn't know him as actor. They all knew him as Farmer Booth. Farmer Booth, that's what Yes, that's what uh, they knew him as. And they didn't know him as the actor, Junius Brutus Booth. So yeah, he was very happy on the farm. Yeah, he was the most content on there. And he didn't drink and have his freaks when he was on the farm. Interesting. Now, eventually, Adelaide found out that Edwin had a, not only a life, but a family. Yeah, that's an interesting in, in Maryland. Can you tell us how Adelaide found out and how she reacted to this new piece of information? Yes, Adelaide contacted Junius. Um, he kept sending money each year to her. And she's, I don't know why she took this as like normal, but she did. But um, her son Richard got to an age where he needed to go out and, and, and go out into the world. And Richard um, acquired the same talent for languages as his father did. So he kind of tutored um, foreign languages to, to students. But he asked, can we send Richard to you and you can help him in America? And Junior sent money. Richard came over and Richard quickly had him be his helper um, to keep him away from the farm. And this went on for two years until one day Richard was backstage and someone said, oh, you're the illegitimate child. He went, what? I am the son of Junius. I'm the only son of Junius Bruce Booth. And he said, no, he's got a whole nother family. And when Richard realized that he contacted his mother right away and says, Mom, you got to get over here right now and legitimize my birth. So she did not have the money to come over, but Junius's old rival, Edmund Keene, saw the point of how to dig into Junius. He paid for her passage over. And she came in and, and <clears throat> soon she got here. He was on tour and she said, Let, I don't want to do anything until he gets back from tour. Let him make his money. <laughs> And then um, as soon as he got back, she just assaulted him and just hounded him. And, and he just escaped. And, and every time he went down to sell in the market, um, she would go out and just screaming at him in public. And if Marianne was there at the booth, she would be screaming at him saying, you know, you, you illegitimate family and I'm the real wife. And Marianne um, took it pretty graciously. She um, kind of snuck off in side roads, everything. Adelaide actually came all the way out to the Booth Farm um, once and when Junius wasn't there and she was just screaming. So that's how she found out. Did the marital status ever get sorted out? Or? Yes, eventually he got a divorce. And in 1851, Junius and Marianne were married we're, legitimately. We're legally married yes. in this country. Wow. So that was 1851. So when did he build Tudor Hall? Junius was started thinking about retirement and um, he was, he went on one, he was going to, um, he, he read a book by William Randlett published in England in 1847. It was called The Architect and it was plans for a neo-Gothic houses and also gardens with it. And he picked out this plan called uh, the Parsonage in the Tudor style. And he decided to make that on the, the Booth farm right next to where the, right next to where the, um, the log house stayed. And began construction on that in 1850. Um, at that time during construction, he went out to Southern California. Um, his, his eldest son, Junius Jr. was managing a theater out there and he'd ask, um, ask him to come out with Edwin and act out there. And so he went out to California and performed out there. And he left abruptly and wanted to come back to um, the farm. And he's going across and he told Edwin to stay in, in Southern California. But he's coming back. It was like where the 
Panama Canal as now. He had to cross by land. And he was attacked, robbed. He lost all his money. Um, eventually made it to, to New Orleans and acted there. Um, this is leading up to his death. He performed in New Orleans for the last time, made some money, got on a, a river boat and was heading up towards Cincinnati when um, he had a cold when he got on the boat. Um, that worsened into a fever. There was someone who saw him in the bar at the, on, the, on the steamship, kind of pacing back and forth with his hands behind his back, looking down very um, serious. And someone said, oh, that's the great tragedian, Junius Brutus Booth. And he didn't see him the next day and found out where he was in his quarters and knocked on the door when it introduced himself. And then he was really sick and could barely talk at this point. And this uh, passenger helped him, had to almost help him turn over. And so he got um, help to have the room cleaned out, the beds changed and everything, came back the next day and his jaw was kind of like clenched and he couldn't talk and, and he said, and he realized he, Junius was dying and he asked Junius, you're married? And he goes, of course I am. And he said, do you have any message for? And he couldn't get the words out. He tried to tell him about his trip across with Panama and said that he suffered greatly there and really hurt him. Asia, and um, the next day he died. And Asia Booth said in her memoir that um, he died of consumption of the bowels. But a lot of people said he was drinking a lot of Mississippi River, muddy water while he was on a boat. Could have contributed to it. We're not quite sure. They put him in a metal casket and contacted Mary Ann, told him to come to Cincinnati. And she got the body and brought it back home. Okay, so help me with the timeline here. 1947, or 1847, he reads a book. Yes. Tudor Hall. Began construction in 1850. In 1850. It was completed in 1852, the same 18... year that Junius died. Okay, so... In, so and in the middle of all that, he actually completes whatever his divorce is. Adelaide is final, and yes. he marries Marianne in 1851. In 1851. Yes. So, so those last few years were still very busy years. From how old was he when he died? 56. 56. So he was a comparatively young man by today's standards. Yeah, he was lucky <clears throat> to live as long as he did with all he went through, and I haven't even touched on all the tragedy and just the turmoil that went on um, that's for another time well let me ask this let me do two things right now i'm going to invite those of you who are watching um, if you've got questions that you'd like uh, to need to ask tom um, use the chat or q a features of um, the webinar you'll find those either at the top or the very bottom of your screen as you move the mouse um, so you can put your questions in there <clears throat> and I will look for them and, and ask them. Then I'm going to ask you two things. One, what do we know about uh, Junius Brutus Booth's relationship with John Wilkes? Well, John, John Wilkes Booth, you know, he never saw his father act. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was 14 when his father died. And his father was on the road most of the time. And and he also stayed in a lot of boarding schools. So he never really had that close a relationship with his father, though John was one of um, Junius's favorites. Um, he was most like Junius, um, but he, he never taught him to act or anything else. But John, um, it, staying at the boarding schools, they were some of the wealthiest families sent their children, their sons to the schools that he boarded at, and they were all landowners and slave owners. And John Wilkes kind of got that um, mentality. That's where he picked it up. Edwin and Junius were anti-slavery. And in fact, Junius helped escape, slaves escaped on his, on his uh, property. He and Richard, um, this was before uh, John was born, but um, many a slave run across his farm and he actually bought slaves and freed them himself. 
Now there was a couple who worked for him for an, for the family for a number of years out at Tudor Hall, whom I believe were at least the husband was Reed. Joe and Ann Hall. Joe Joe Hall was a, a slave on a neighboring farm, and and Junius hired him out to work on his farm, mm -hmm. and. Joe loved it there, and eventually Junior said, "How would you like me to buy you? You know." And in five years, I'll I'll set you free you to make up for the cost of how much it cost. And Joe agreed to it, so he went to the to the um, his owner, and he was sold. And Joe actually was free, but he wanted to stay with Junius. He was kind of a family member. A lot of people called him Joe Booth, also. Um, Joe married a another uh, woman on a, on the Roger, I think it was, yeah, the Rogers farm and her name was Ann Hall and they got married and they both lived with um, Junius and Ann became almost like a, a second mother to all the kids. She loved all of them. She loved John Wilkes. A lot. I yes, a lot. Before. Yes. I read that she was very, very fond of him. Yes. Um, in fact, I read somewhere that she was asked if he, after the assassination, if he had, if John Wilkes had stopped at his house on the way to, her house on the way to escape, would she have helped him? And she said, oh yes. Absolutely, she I said yes. Him. He was a good boy. And good she would boy. leave food out for him in case he did. In case he did. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> tell us now about Tudor Hall today. How can people get a chance to see it? How do people get in touch? What do you do out at Tudor Hall? I know it's there in, uh, on the road between Bel Air and Churchville very end of Tudor Lane. Right. So tell us about Tudor Hall. Tudor Hall was purchased by the county in 2006 and the Junius B. Booth Society was formed in the same year to open Tudor Hall to the public and turn the first floor to museum which we have done. Um, we opened Tudor Hall to the public for tours and special talks from early April to the first weekend of November every other Sunday and you can go on to if you want to find out uh, who's talking and when the tours are, you can go on to just Google Spirits of Tudor Hall, go on the Facebook or the blog spot and you'll find the descriptions of the talks and uh, the times. Okay, so you have a blog spot and you have a Facebook, Facebook page. page. Yes. You don't have a website. Is what I'm no, no, we don't have a okay. website. So that so you need to use the Facebook or that blog spot. Yes. And it's the Spirits of Tudor Hall. Spirits of Tudor Hall. If you remember that, Google that. Those will come up. Those will come up. Yes. Um, another question that we have, are there any Booth family descendants in this area? That's a question we get. We don't know. We don't know if there are. There's many people who claim to be Booth descendants, and some even claim to be descended directly from John Wilkes Booth, but there's no DNA evidence, and so we don't know. I don't want to speculate. Right. Well, the, I know that the stories I've heard about Booth family members have all been other places. Asia lived in this, I'm trying to remember where, Asia married and she lived. Asia married after the, after um, the assassination, she married a uh, Edwin Booth's best friend growing up, um, John S Clark Sleeper. And he, when he started acting, he changed his name to John Sleeper Clark because he didn't think an actor should have Sleeper for her last name. She ended up marrying him. And after the assassination, just to avoid public scandal, um, John wanted to disassociate himself with the Booth name and they moved to England where she lived the rest of her life. Okay. And then Edwin, of course, moved to New York, moved to New York before the assassination and lived there and traveled, I suppose. Well, yeah, he lived in Philadelphia, he lived in New York, um, and he started a club called The Players. Mm -hmm in New York. It was a house he owned on Gramercy Park and he turned it into a, a club, private club, uh, turned it over to it for the group and called it the players and a lot of the top actors and movers and shakers at the time, including Mark Twain, William Sherman um, were members and it was a club where he, actors could meet with the top uh, social socialites and also the movers and shakers and and without the public view he wouldn't allow any critics in there to become members and he lived out there the rest of his life 
So can you tell us one more story about Junius Brutus Boot? Well, I'm trying to fig figure out which one that. Well, you've got several, we have some time. All righty. Um, I'll, I'll tell you an amusing one that happens to be with he and Edwin. When they were up in Boston, um, Junius was performing and he was going to a hotel room and a sculptor by the name of Thomas Gould, a very famous sculptor and also done a bust of, of Edwin, I mean, of, of Junius, saw Junius going to the hotel and Junius saw him and he tried, he ran up the stairs, ran into his room, told, told Edwin, Gould, I'm out. And he dove underneath the bed. Well, so he's hiding under a bed. Thomas School goes up the stairs, knocks on the door, and Edwin answers it. And he goes in the room and says, he was surprised because he just saw Junius running up the stairs. And so he's talking to Edwin, and he kept looking around, like, what's going on? And where did he go? But it got to a point where there's an awkward silence in their conversation. And Junius misread that, and he yelled out from under the bed, is that damn boar gone yet? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so My there was, heavens. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, he, he had a lot of different episodes. One time he was drinking um, with a friend and his friend brought him back to his house and it was getting real snowstorm out. So he said to sleep it off. And at, right at midnight, a couple of the servants heard the commotion outside the house and in the middle of the snowstorm, Junius was outside naked, looking, screaming at lines from King Lear up into the sky. So just crazy moments that he had. But I will um, end on this note here. Booth and Poe together. This was in a newspaper article. Junius Brutus Booth had many friends, Edgar Allan Poe, the son of an acting family being one. The two drank together and together seized a man who offended them after a play and suspended him by the breaches on the spikes of a convenient area railing where they left him kicking and howling while they pursued their torturous way in gladsome mood. And where was this published? I don't know, this is a clipping found. It's Yes, he had many different friends. What a combination. Yes. What a combination. Let me see here. Um, what sun, when's the next Sunday? What Sundays? We have a question. What Sundays are the tours available for September and October? Um, you said go on to the, the blog spot. Okay. I don't have the exact dates. I was going to say, you, you just had one this past Sunday. We have one this coming Sunday. Oh, this coming yes. Sunday. This yes. So this coming Sunday, there's one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, go on Spirits of Tudor Hall on the blog spot or Facebook, and uh, you'll see you'll see um, the tours and the special talks. And I know you advertise them in the Aegis as well. I think I've seen them on the... Yeah, they get the information wrong sometimes, yes. though. Oh, that would be confusing. Yeah, most of our... Most of the people get it on Facebook and other yeah, places. Yeah, I've seen it on your Facebook page. Yeah. I've seen it on your Facebook page. Okay, so, but you will have one this coming Sunday. And what time will that be? Uh, the, the one o'clock and two o'clock. And the topic? The topic this Sunday, I believe, is John Wilkes Booth and his Confederate friends. Okay. I believe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, we certainly hope that you have enjoyed this presentation about the life of Junius Brutus Booth. And our thanks to Tom for an interesting presentation. Um, we urge you to visit Tudor Hall one weekend, go this weekend if you have a chance, and get to see the home of one of America's first theater families. On the Historical Soci Society's, whoops, let's see here, before we go too further, hold on. Um, ah, there we go. On the Historical Society's website, um, <clears throat> you can purchase several historical bulletins about Tudor Hall and its inhabitants. You can learn about Edwin Booth in a two-part series. And Joe and Ann Hall, whom we talked about briefly, there's an entire issue devoted to their activities at Tudor Hall. Um, 
If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation or becoming a member of the Historical Society of Harford County. Our website is at www.harfordhistory.org. Our next virtual event will be Tuesday, October the 12th at 2.30. Jim Gibb will tell us about the archeological dig that's underway in Joppa Town and what it reveals about colonial Joppa. Those of you who may have attended our annual meeting this past weekend heard a portion of that talk. Jim will be expanding on that and telling us more about the artifacts and what they've learned already about that colonial village. The event is free. You can get your ticket today on the Historical Society's website. On the website, you'll also find a list of other coming events, including the Genealogy Conference on October the 9th, um, and a paint and sip at Unlimited Art in Haverty Grace on October the 14th. You'll also find information about how to join the society or to give a membership as a gift. Again, our web address is www.harfordhistory.org. Thank you, and please join us for future events.